Well, welcome. We're going to talk about emotionally healthy leaders, not because I have it down. I am on the middle of a journey of what God's doing and uh, learning lots. Matter of fact, I learned a lot of what I've learned came through my wife and her journey. So I want to give her credit. Let's just pray and commit this time to the Lord, and then we'll start out. I want to make time for question and answers at the end as well. Father, thank you for your love and care for us. <clears throat> you are an amazing Father, and it's our hearts that we would connect in an even deeper way with you, that we would know what it means to enjoy your company and for you to enjoy ours. So as we look at these things today, Lord, we're all learners. We all need more of you. So would you open our hearts, our minds? Holy Spirit, we ask, would you just do your work in us now as we share together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I've been in ministry for over 40 years, uh, some as a missionary, most of it as a pastor, and uh, like all of you, you run into people that uh, you had a good relationship with or you saw God blessing their ministry, and then something happened, they got off the rails, and uh, you just wonder how in the world does that happen? Uh, there was a, a couple that had a, a network of churches. Things were going strong. God was blessing and anointing that. And then it came out that he'd been having an affair for years. And his wife didn't want to admit it. And the whole network kind of dissolved. Um, and I'm sure we can all share stories like that time and time and time again. I mean, obviously, we've seen the big claim leaders, many that have fallen that way. And, uh, you know, God... He gives us our gifts without repentance, but uh, it's the character that makes or breaks a ministry, really. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had my own shares of challenges. Uh, I came from a broken family, and um, stuff that I've had to face over the years that showed up in my marriage and in my ministry, and, and uh, you know, it's been a journey. And I could, all I can say is I'm just so grateful to God and to my wife uh, for where I'm at today. And I still have a long way to go, but I think like all of us, we can all say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, where would we be today? And uh, so this whole emotionally healthy thing really has to do with uh, the depth of our relationship with God, because that's the foundation. Uh, we can do lots of things for God, but if we lack the, the relationship with God, um, it just doesn't work. And uh, Peter Scazzaro says in his Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he says, the emotionally unhealthy leader is someone who operates in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual <coughs> deficit. <coughs> Come on. Sorry. Okay. So the un un emotionally unhealthy leader is someone who operates in a continuous state of emotional and spiritual deficit, lacking emotional maturity and a being with God, sufficient to sustain their doing for God. And uh, he goes on to say that oftentimes emotional deficits manifest primarily through a pervasive lack of awareness. And uh, that self-awareness is kind of a, a key indicator of where are we at in our emotional health. He says unhealthy leaders lack, for example, awareness of their feelings, their weaknesses, and their limits. <clears throat> they lack an awareness of how their past impacts their present and how others experience them. They also lack the capacity and the skill to enter deeply into the feelings and perspectives of others. They carry these immaturities with them into their teams and everything they do. You know, it's amazing how, as leaders, you know, leading churches, leading people, working with people, uh, how our stuff overflows into our ministry and into the, our ability to uh, empathize with people, to listen effectively, to reflect back, uh, and to lead. And um, <clears throat> somebody once said, we all have craziness in our background. And we may not want to admit it, but we all have it in one way, shape, or form. And uh, you notice that if you're married, 
you married into craziness. <laughs> Your spouse married into craziness. <laughs> and you have to learn how to deal with it. And it's the same with ministry. You know, we have our craziness, but then so are the ones that uh, we minister to. And you get that mixed together, and it exposes things in our lives that God wants to deal with. And I think when I was getting into ministry, there was always this idea that, you know, it's your mind and your will. That's what drives the train. And emotions were the caboose that were just a reaction to those two things. And so oftentimes in evangelical circles in the Protestant church, we've ignored emotions. And uh, in our theology, in, in our approach to ministry, <coughs> even in, in our relating to, uh, to God and to others. And yet emotions are part of God's attributes. He cried, he rejoices, he gets angry. And we read that stuff and sometimes it just kind of goes right past us. We have those emotions and God uses those in positive and negative ways in our lives. But I found that a lot of Christians, myself included, we kind of just skate over those things because if we're truly spiritual, then we should be happy all the time. Mm -hmm. At least give that front to people because otherwise they'll think our Christianity doesn't work. Our leadership's not effective. What we preach about must not work if you're going through a hard time. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be vulnerable and transparent, uh, even to ourselves oftentimes. And leaders sometimes say things like, I want to be a better leader. I'm open and eager to learn, but I don't know where to start. Others say, I know something's not right. I feel it's only a matter of time before something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes these are things that are going on, they're kind of running in the background of our minds, our feelings, and uh, they're things that I think God wants us to learn to pay attention to. Some say I'm stuck in an environment I can't change. I have a leadership team in a negative situation and I feel powerless to do anything about it. Or I'm doing the best I can, but I, I'm not having any impact. I'm running programs, but I'm not changing lives. <clears throat> I've plateaued and I'm stagnant. Some say, I feel too overwhelmed by work to enjoy life with God, with myself, and with others. I'm missing out on the joys of life because of the crushing demands of leadership. You can fill in the blank. How are you doing? I know for me, uh, there have been periods in my life, in my ministry, where uh, I basically said to, to Nancy, can I just re resign? <laughs> I don't want to deal with this anymore. And a lot of what I'm dealing with was facing my own stuff. And it wasn't the people so much, but my own things in my own life. Scazzaro lists four characteristics of unhealthy emotional leaders. One is this low self-awareness. Uh, you know, people who, they don't know how to truly listen. They don't know how to truly be empathetic with others. They don't know how to uh, reflect or take social cues in a good way. You ever run into somebody that <clears throat> you ask them one question, all of a sudden we're off to the races. <laughs> and they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about them, their ministry, or whatever else. And there's a real lack of self-awareness. Even as you start to back away, you know, they just keep on talking, maybe even following you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny, but they're just not self-aware. And man, how does that affect our ministry if we're like that? And we can be unself-aware unself in a lot of different ways. But that low self-awareness really is a challenge, that something that God wants to grow in us. Another one is prioritizing ministry over marriage or singleness if we're single. You know, we spend, we get married to the ministry more than married to our spouse. And we give our time, our energy, our focus, all to that, and then our families suffer. Or we do too much for God. How's that for Harrison? <laughs> you know, can you do too much for God? Sometimes less is more. And um, then failing to practice a Sabbath rhythm, which we'll get into a little bit more. But if you walk away with anything today, this is the statement I'd like you to walk away with. Is our activity for God more than my being with God and sustained? That's the challenge of being emotionally healthy. Because as leaders, we want to do for God. We've got this calling we want to respond to in our lives. We want to follow God, serve Him, obey Him, 
do things for him for the kingdom. And yet what God wants most from us is just us. That's where it starts. And we can tell ourselves that, and we can preach that, but in those quiet times when it's just God and me, where's our heart? Do we really believe that? Do we let God minister to us and actually say, man, I just, I just love being with you. <coughs> I think that we agree that a person who practices being before doing operates from a place of emotional and spiritual fullness. They're deeply aware of themselves. They're deeply aware of God and others. And so this results in our doing for God being adequately sustained because our being with God, that deep, intimate connection with Him, serves us. Schizero says there's this be before you do approach to ministry. He summarizes in three statements. You cannot give what you do not possess. If you're not emotionally healthy, you can't help others get to that place. And obviously it's a spectrum of emotional health. What you do is important, but who you are is even more important. That's how God views us. Who you are is more important to God than what you do for Him. Because it's out of that place of being with God that what you do for God is effective or not. And then the state you are in is the state you give to others. And uh, I think these are all, nothing, none of this is a surprise to any of us. But I think being able to put that in the context of emotional health is important. I was, you know, some people said, well, this is all just a bunch of psychobabble. It's navel gazing. You're just being self centered. We need to get out there and evangelize, and build the kingdom, and all these things. And yet, some of these famous people in history have said, well, that's not necessarily the place to start. Meister Eckert, who was a Dominican writer in the 13th century, said, no one can know God if they first do not know themselves. So it's more than just knowing yourself, your personality type, or your gifts, or your abilities. There's an inner part of ourselves that God wants us to become aware of. And then Augustine said, how can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? And pray, grant me, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. And then Calvin said, our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. So there's a desire I think God has that we would become self-aware. Who are we deep inside? And oftentimes that means facing the fears, facing the weaknesses, facing the failures, and being honest with and vulnerable with God and sometimes with others, because that's the way God begins to heal and bring us into wholeness. Paul wrote this in Ephesians. He said, to put off your old self, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And uh, you know, who are we? It's oftentimes easy for us to become identified with our ministry. Um, you know, but who are you without your job? Who are you without your ministry? Who are you without your marriage? <clears throat> who are you without your skills, without your education? Who are you at the core of your being? I think sometimes we get so focused on out there that we don't look in here and think, who am I really? And appreciate what God sees. And, uh, you know, it's being able to understand that sometimes our identity gets so wrapped up in what we do. And the time you can tell that that's true is when you change situations. I was in missions for 12 years, came home from the mission field. Now I'm no longer a missionary. It took me five years to figure that out, to do the transition. And a lot of that had to do with my identity and who I was. It had to do with my health and God recognizing me. God doesn't care what you do. He wants you to know how much he loves you. And that took me a long time to figure that out. And here I've been in missions for 12 years. He looked back and think, wow, I wonder what I multiply. So you just trust God even in our weaknesses, he can use that. But so oftentimes, our identity is threatened when something painful happens or traumatic happens in our ministry or our lives, our marriages, our families or something. 
And then the core of who we are becomes exposed. And it's painful to face that sometimes. And our usual reaction, particularly in our American culture, is to deny that. Uh, we're just going to deny the ugly, the unwanted parts. We try to hide it from others. Uh, and even, you know, we try to hide it from God. We never talk about it with God. Or if we do, it's kind of a fleeting prayer. And, um, but we don't sit <coughs> and face that time with God and say, Lord, show me. Help me walk through this. So who we are at a core will express itself, often in very unwanted and undesired ways. And um, as Christians, our leaders, our hearts are, are for God, His kingdom. But do we have the same heart for ourselves that God does? And um, do we take care of our souls? Because your soul, my soul, is a precious gift from God. How much do we invest in what God counts as precious? Do we measure, how, how do we measure the success of a ministry? I think, especially as Americans, we get really trapped into this. We look at numbers, how many in our attendance, what's our giving like, how many conversions have we experienced, how many baptisms. And for many who are particularly small church pastors, we struggle. Because we see the big churches being blessed with finances, conversions, baptisms, etc. And we think, wow, I must be a failure. That's not how God sees us, but it's that measure of success that we soak in from the culture. And I ran across a measure of success that has really ministered to me. And it says that uh, we should need to measure the quality of our success by the number of people who are, have deeply transformed lives. You know, the quality of people's transformed lives should be the measure of our success because that's how God looks at us. He wants a depth, the quality, a relationship with us. And because we lead out more out of who we are than what we do, you see how that rolls over in, uh, into our ministry. And if we fail to recognize who we are on the inside, that's going to affect every aspect of our leadership in small ways and little ways. It, it damages us because of our frustrations with people. They don't want to follow us. They criticize us. They do all sorts of things. <clears throat> and it's not always our fault, but sometimes it is, and we don't recognize it. Or we're causing a, a reaction in them that comes back on us, and it's kind of this vicious circle. And the most challenging and the most difficult task, I think, first task is we have to learn how to lead ourselves. And uh, a guy named Steve Carter wrote a book called The Thing Beneath the Thing. And uh, he said this, our past experiences will drive our present behavior. Um, I think oftentimes I grew up in a home where my dad was very cynical. And he uh, was cynical about every aspect of life. And it rolled over into my perspective and the way that I related to people. And God had to really deal with me in my leadership, not to be cynical, even a, in a joking way. Because so many people, that's kind of the, what they grew up with, what they're immersed in. And it doesn't reflect really who God is. We can joke and you know have fun, but if your heart is cynical like mine was, <clears throat> it's not a healthy place to come from because it expresses at the core unbelief. And uh, at least that, for me, that was the, the challenge for me. So I had to learn how to lead myself. I had to learn there's some things in my life that I need to change. And uh, that's how, in one way, my past experiences affected my present behavior. You ever notice how sometimes we get triggered by something? Maybe somebody comes up to us, criticizes something, a decision we've made, or something about our leadership, or even our sermon. And it causes a reaction in us. And it's taking those times and saying, now, why did that cause such a tsunami of feelings in me? Why am I angry? Or why am I so down on myself? Why do I feel rejected? What's that? What's causing the pain inside of me? What is it that triggers my emotions? And that's, I think, where we need to make time to really evaluate those things. Take a look, spend some time with God and say, 
I don't get this, Lord. Why am I triggered? Why did this hit so deep inside of me? Because we, we tend to, along with busy lives and they've got ministry and responsibility, we tend to make excuses for those things. It's just the way I am. That's the way my family was. That's, you know, whatever we come up with. <clears throat> Instead of pausing and taking time and saying, Lord, what is it? And we kind of create this false narrative about our lives and even our paths. Paths. And, um, you know, a lot of times we even create false stories about other people. It's their fault or, you know, that's the way they always are. And um, the lies of the enemy take over. And we look for villains. It's their problem. They're the reason I'm like this. So this is the reason why, you know, uh, things aren't working out. One guy said, anytime you get hysterical, it's historical. <laughs> <laughs> when you get upset, there's something in your past that's triggering that. Yes. And we can't just blame it on someone else. Mm -hmm. But we have to be committed to our call and our ministry, but also to our character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Church has been tremendous character building for me, relating to other people. And uh, it's being able to face the pain and the trauma in our lives and deal with it. Um, like some, oftentimes leaders have a people pleasing tendency because we got into ministry because we love people, we care for people, enjoy working with people. And yet there can be that shadow side where we want to please people. And that brings me to what Scazzaro, Peter Scazzaro calls the shadow. He says, your shadow is the accumulation of untamed emotions, less than pure motives and thoughts that, while largely unconscious, strongly influence and shape your behaviors. It is the damaged but mostly hidden version of who you are. Aspects of the shadow may be sinful, but they may also simply be weaknesses or wounds. Um, some examples of shadows, or behavior, sinful behaviors that come from shadows. It's judgmental perfectionism, outbursts of anger, jealousy, resentment, lust, greed, bitterness, or subtly, more subtly, a need to rescue others and be liked by them, a need to be noticed, an inability to stop working, a tendency towards isolation, rigidity, we go on and on. What our shadows have to do with our past, and we often need to explore what are the roots that we came from? What are maybe some of the generational sins of my family, <clears throat> my forefathers? What about my parents? How they <clears throat> grew me up? What was my home like? The atmosphere in the home? How did we relate to one another? Uh, what perceptions about myself did I take on from my parents? Not necessarily true, but that was our perception. My dad said to me one time, <clears throat> he said something that what I heard him say was, I don't think you can make it in college. You just don't have it, what it takes. I remember the day that I graduated from university, I went up to my dad and I said to him, I did it. You didn't think I could do it, but I did it. And he looked at me funny like, what are you talking about? And I repeated back what I'd heard. He said, I never said that. What I said was, I didn't think you'd be interested enough to go to college. You were more interested in a vocation. But I twisted that around wow. out of my desire to please my dad. And all four years, I felt driven. I got to prove myself to my dad. And it's those kind of things that oftentimes are in the shadows. We need to take a look at them. Yeah. so that God can deal with them and bring them into the light and they can be respond, we can respond to truth. So when it comes to understanding and facing up to the shadow within, oftentimes Christian leaders, we fall into two different um, extremes. One extreme says, I'm totally bad. I am terribly sinful. No good things dwell inside of me. Uh, Romans 7. The other extreme is, I'm totally good. I'm a new creation in Christ, a saint who is wonderfully and uniquely made. Mm -hmm. It's both and. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that works. Only God does. Mm -hmm. If you have the answer, let me know. They both have elements of biblical truth. But if we go to one extreme or to the other, 
we're not able to walk in transparency and vulnerability with God because we don't see ourselves as God sees us. He doesn't take these two extreme views. So we need to have a healthy perspective on our shadow and hold both of these things in kind of a divine tension. Here's some things from your shadow. Uh, you know it's your shadow when, for example, you act out inappropriately when you're under pressure. Maybe it's that burst of anger. You break into tears or you break down or whatever it might be. But it's an unhealthy response. I know a guy who, <clears throat> one morning he was part of our worship team and uh, he hadn't practiced. And he came in and he was just fumbling around with his guitar. And one of the other musicians said, kind of out loud, not directly to him, said, he did it again. He's terrible, he shouldn't be playing guitar. Mm -hmm. The guy packed up his guitar and left the church and never came back. Mm -hmm. It was an overreaction mm -hmm. to what had been said. He refused to face the shadow mm -hmm. in his life and deal with it. Mm -hmm. And he's still not going to church anymore. Another example is we don't want someone to succeed because they've hurt us. That's such a subtle thing. A few years ago, we experienced in our church this exodus. Um, we probably lost a third to half of our people just over a, about a year and a half period. Um, there may have been some triggers that did that. We had been looking for a building, thought we had something, and it fell through. <coughs> I think people just kind of gave up their up their hands and, and left. Um, nobody ever said to me, it's because of something you've done, but they left. That was really painful. Okay. I had somebody say to me, people would have been my cell group leaders who we loved deeply. We had, I thought we had a close relationship. They sat by living and they looked at me. They said, all our friends are leaving, so I guess we'll leave too. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I looked at each other and we said later, well, I guess we know we weren't their friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That hurt us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, we take on those things, and a lot of times as Christian leaders, we just can say, well, that's, that's ministry, that's life. And that's true, but if we don't take those things to God and lament them, truly lament them and take them and, and express our feelings, deal with the feelings, and it's not having a pity party. But man, look at how many psalms these guys go on and rant and rage <laughs> to the Lord, you know? God... You know, right. throw their babies on the rocks and do all these horrible things, you know. A whole book of lamentations. Yeah. And it's learning to lament. And that's a healthy thing for us. But as we do that, we can help others in our churches learn how to lament in a healthy way too. And uh, sometimes we disregard our spouse, our co-worker, when they bring up a difficult issue. I don't want to hear it. I'm busy, you know. I, I'm not even going to go into how many times Nancy and I got into conflict because of that. I didn't want to hear what she was saying. She was trying to hold me accountable, and I didn't want to hear it because it meant more work or it meant that I was wrong and needed to correct something. But we keep doing the same thing over and over, even though the consequences remain negative. Yeah. We're angry, jealous, envious a lot. These are all things that are shadow in our shadow. We do say things out of fear of what other people might think. We get busier rather than more reflective when we're anxious. We tend to idolize others who seem to have been given a special gift by God, forgetting that they too have a shadow and are broken like us. We make negative comments to others about those who frustrate us rather than going directly to them and talking about them. I think I'm guilty in all these. But it's hardful, it's painful and humbling to have to face our shadow. And you know your shadow follows you everywhere. You just somehow can't leave it behind. But it undermines the best of who we are. And when we consider that God desires for Christ to be formed within us, and he's greatly concerned for our character, the implications of dealing with our shadow take on a whole lot more importance. Because our shadows limit our ability to serve other people. And, uh, you know, we have to learn how to be humble, how to appropriately be vulnerable, transparent with people. Um, Paul the Apostle said, I am the worst of all sinners. That was Paul. 
and acknowledging rather than denying the reality and depth of the shadow is one indication of emotional and spiritual maturity. Uh, recently, I did a series um, of messages, and during the series of messages, I started to talk about a lot of the hurts that I'd gone through in the last few years because of that exodus of people from our church. And I said to people, I can finally share this with you now because I feel like I'm starting to get healed. I couldn't have done it before because I would have been sharing out hurt and bitterness. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how many people came up afterwards during these messages So thanks for sharing your heart. Because they deal with the same stuff that we do. And sometimes they think, for whatever crazy reason, that we're holy men and women. We never go through this stuff. Mm -hmm. And by being vulnerable, we can do it from a place that health helps them. Scazzaro said, one of the great truths of life is this, you cannot change what you are unaware of. So as we look to our shadows, as we look to those things in our, in our inner lives that oftentimes we don't want to face, those ugly parts, those weaknesses, those failures, those things we wish would just disappear, we have to become aware of that or we'll never be able to change. You know, Ron Meyer said to me one time, you can't change what you don't take responsibility for. That's right. And that was such a good, wise word. Alice Willard says, we have to model and live out what we are preaching. That grace is the best thing. That we can be honest. That repentance is beautiful. We can acknowledge the truth about ourselves as leaders and go first. Proverbs 423 says, above all else, guard your heart. Mm -hmm. Part of guarding that heart, I believe, is for us to understand how important God sees who you and I are. The heart is the core of who we are. And if we hold it precious before God, it means we're willing to deal with this painful stuff. Because that's what God wants. He wants us to be healed, to be free from these things. And when we just gloss it over, deny it, ignore it or whatever, we're doing a disservice to God. Imagine if your kids were hurt, and they wouldn't talk to you about it. My kids went through that. I've got grandkids now that do that. Yes. Oh, come on, what's wrong? You know, tell me. You can tell me about it. No, they won't do it. You don't know how to help them. And how much is God like that with us? There are a lot of resources to help deal with our shadows, and we don't have time to get into all the details. But those are some of the things. I just want to share just a few practical things about becoming emotionally healthy. There are a ton of them, and I'm only just going to share three of them um, because we don't have time, but three things that have helped me. And uh, what I just want to say in dealing with the shadow, um, please do not be afraid to get help. I've been in counseling. I've been through restoring the foundations. I've gone through, I don't know, different things over the, the course of, of the years. And it's all kind of helped, and, and I feel like God's honored my willingness to step out and say, I, I need to know. And as leaders, sometimes it's hard for us to admit that. And it can even be harder to find someone we trust that we can truly, truly be honest. I mean, one of my fears going into counseling all this time was thinking, I'm a pastor. What are they going to think of God if I start sharing all this mess inside of me? You know? And yet that's not my problem. That's between them and God. And I had to share the stuff going on inside of me. And it helped. But that's the thought that went through my mind when I was concerned. Should I go? Should I go? That kind of stuff. There's some practices because it takes time for us to, to be courageous, to be humble, um, to, to enter into all this. First thing we need to do is learn to slow down. Don't you love to hear that? <laughs> First thing goes through my mind is, how in the world do you slow down? <laughs> Jesus said this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many of you will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evil doers. 
man, that's hard to get my head around. But he's saying, these people were so busy with ministry, they didn't have time for me. And Jesus has to confront the self-deception. I mean, these are wonderful things <coughs> that are going on. But the idea of knowing, he says, I never knew you. That's a verb that describes an intimacy, a deep, intimate connection. And that's what God wants for us. Um, it's the same verb that was used with Adam and Eve and God in the garden. And uh, we have to slow down. And we have to surrender our ministries, our lives to Christ because what we want is a genuine fruit, not a bunch of busy activity. So maybe a key question is, to what extent is the door of your heart open to Him? Have we allowed the incessant demands of leadership to preoccupy us so that we don't have time to keep that door open continuously? Is our abiding in Christ sporadic? Are we operating on kind of a spiritual autopilot? We just have to be honest with ourselves, you know? It's no surprise to God. Sometimes I get so busy, I don't know how, how am I gonna have time for spiritual quiet time in the morning? How am I gonna time just to slow down and spend with God? Just the demands, the pressures of life. And yet God's been on me, through my wife especially. Slow down, give it up, you don't have to do everything. <laughs> See, what we do matters, but what we, who we are matters even more. Jonathan Edwards wrote, and I'm going to paraphrase it, that the only mark of a genuine spiritual maturity and ministry effectiveness is the outworking of agape, a self-giving love for God and for others. So the quality of our life, the quality of our leadership, the devil can never counterfeit that. <coughs> and the source of agape love can only found, be found where? in that inviting union with God. So how do we cultivate that loving union? I think in one way we just have to learn to slow down. Yeah. Every, each one of us, we've got to kind of face that idea, but it's being able to take that time and just sit in, in the presence of God. I have a good friend of mine who's a pastor in a four-square church, and he said for a year, God told him, I want you to go to your church sanctuary and every Monday on your day off, I want you to sit in the sanctuary for an hour. I don't want you to pray. I don't want you to read the Bible. I just want you to sit there. Sit in my presence. So he did. He said his secretary thought he was nuts. But he sat. Every Monday he went in, sat in the sanctuary for an hour. Just sat there in the presence of God. He said after a year's time of doing this, he noticed that his anointing, his effectiveness, his ability to get more done had increased exponentially. And other people even noticed it common in mind. And he attributed it directly to that, that he just sat in the presence of God, enjoyed the fellowship. He didn't ask for things, he didn't pray, he didn't cry out for stuff, he didn't study the word, he just enjoyed the presence of God. John Ortberg, in his book Soul Care, says, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. That's the story of my life. Other quotes from Ortberg in his book. He said, what matters is not the accomplishments you achieve, what matters is the person you become. The desperate need of the soul is not for intelligence, or talent, or yet excitement, just depth. He said, we mistake clutter for life. If we cease to be busy, do we matter? He said, there's no prayer. It goes, God help me be the man my dog thinks I am. <laughs> Ortberg also said, the soul thrives not through our accomplishments, but through simply being with God. Pretty heavy stuff. Some depth stuff that I really had to learn. Blaise Pasquale said this, I have discovered that all the unhappiness of men arises from one single fact, that they are unable to stay quietly 
in their own room. I don't know about you, for me, the hardest thing, discipline I've had to learn is just to be quiet, just to be silent. There are times I have to put a piece of paper next to me. Because as soon as I start being silent, man, all these things I need to do start popping into my mind. So I write them down so I don't forget them, and then I can relax. That's been a discipline that's really challenging, just to be quiet before God. Not seeking His will, not trying to pray or ask for stuff, or figure things out, but just to enjoy His presence. And it's in solitude that, that we can rest. Another aspect that I want to mention is Sabbath. Did you ever notice if you look at the Ten Commandments, what's the longest commandment? It's the fourth one. It's about the Sabbath. You know, Sabbath is not, this is what uh, Peterson says, Sabbath is not primarily about me or how it benefits me. It's about God and how God formed me. It is not, in the first place, about what I do or don't do. It is about God completing and resting, and blessing, and sanctifying. It means stopping and being quiet long enough to see the open eye with wonder, resurrection. <clears throat> Sabbath is not a day off. It took my wife 15 years to drill that into me. Because when else are you going to get stuff done around the house, the yard, all these other practical things you got to do? And yet we started taking Sabbath a number of years ago, and I kind of just evolved into it, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll do part of the morning, and then I'll do two-thirds of the day, and then I'll take a 24-hour period. But it was learning to do things in Sabbath that helped me just to stop and enjoy God. And I didn't rush around and do things. And this is an area where I've seen in our church, as we've done emotionally healthy spirituality, with the majority of our church now. That's just one of the areas that a lot of people have commented about. They always thought Sabbath was like a day off. And now they're saying, you know, one guy recently said to me, he said, I tried to take Sabbath on a Sunday, but it just wasn't working. So now I start Saturday night to Sunday night. I take that 24-hour period and I just stop. And here's what Cesaro says are four characteristics of the Sabbath. One is just to stop. <clears throat> Cease all work, paid and unpaid. Now there's a challenge for you, at least for me, because I'm task oriented. And just to stop and being willing, I'm not going to get it all done. Lord, I, somehow you got to help me. But being just able to stop. And then to rest, just to engage you know, activities that restore and replenish us. Things like beauty, things like nature, things like silence, music, being able to truly rest with God. Sometimes I'll read something that's edifying, and sometimes I'll read something that's just pure fiction, pure entertainment. We'll take walks, we'll do different things on our Sabbath day, but just to rest. Another thing he says is delight. Consider what gives you joy and delight. You know, God really wants you to love life, to enjoy doing things that bring you joy. It may be cooking, I can't even boil water, but my wife loves to cook if it doesn't show. Nature, books, things like that. What do you delight in? And then to contemplate, think about, ponder, reflect on the love of God and how that's manifested in your life. Look for God's grandeur around you. It's just being able to stop and just appreciate what God's made. That's what I love about my grandkids. I can just sit back and wonder and think, wow, what an amazing God gave me this piece gifts of little ones like this. Last thing I want to share is another area that's helped me tremendously. And it has to do with limits. That's where you guys with Apple know how to do this somehow. I messed up this. Richard Swenson said this, when you reach the limits of your resources or abilities, you have no margin left. Yet because we don't even know what margin is, we don't realize it's gone. We know that something is not right, but we can't solve the puzzle beyond that. Our pain is palpable, but our assailant remains unnamed. 
So we don't have any margin in life. There's no space for us to live and deal with being flexible. Symptoms of being deleted and that we may be functioning beyond our margins are some of these things. Mm -hmm. Irritability, hypersensitivity, restlessness, compulsive overworking, emotional numbness, escapist behavior, disconnected from our, our identity and calling, not being able to attend to human needs, hoarding energy, slippage in our spiritual practices. Paul spoke about limits. He said, we however will not boast beyond limits, but will keep within the field that God has assigned to us. To reach out even as far as you, we do not boast beyond limits, that is, in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our sphere of action among you may be greatly enlarged. Even Paul knew he had limits. We have limits in what we can do. We need to recognize and accept the limitations in various areas of our lives. You think about Moses. Moses was trying to lead the people of Israel. And he, he was the only judge. And we're talking a couple million people. And so remember his father-in-law Jethro said to him, man, you really got to change something here. You're killing yourself. You're wearing yourself out. And all these people get frustrated with you because you can't make all the decisions. So he exhorted him. Recognize your limits, Moses. Offer, and he offered a, a solution. So here's some areas of limitations that maybe you face. I'm sure there are others too, but maturity. Sometimes our maturity is, is a limit to us. Experience. Anointing. Knowledge. Ability. Calling. Leadership. Finances. Age. Our health, our temperaments, our personality type, our time, our location. We go on and on. You see, we have limits in our lives. Being willing to accept them, it's not, doesn't mean that we're not walking by faith, but it's accepting who we are in Christ. And if God says go beyond your limits, then you go. A lot of times we think in order to be successful for God, we need to go beyond our limits. We spend more time. We try to accumulate a lot of knowledge that we don't necessarily need. Uh, we try to do things that were really not within our calling or our ability. You know, sometimes we try to spend so much time on a message because we want it to be so impactful and we want to be known as good preachers or teachers or whatever. And we spend this exorbitant amount of time. And God can use that, but there's also this time of limits. I'll never be a Charles Stanley or some other famous preacher. And that's okay. God's still going to use me in the place he's called me to. He'll still use you in the place he's called you to. We have limits. Finally, Scazzaro said this, limits are often simply God's gifts and desires. This makes them one of the most counterintuitive, difficult truths in Scripture to embrace. <coughs> because limits doesn't imply lack of faith. It simply means you're human. God's made you unique, but he's also made us dependent on other people. So I've given you some resources, uh, a list of books that have really ministered to me and to my wife. Uh, there are a ton more out there. Uh, but you can take those, and that's where I got a lot of these resources.